This is the story of Turkish Airlines Flight 1951. On the 25th of February 2009, a 737-800 was making the trip from Turkey's Ataturk Airport to Amsterdam's Kipol Airport. The 737 had 135 passengers on board, which included seven crew members. The plane left Istanbul's Ataturk Airport at 8.23 a.m., and the cockpit that day had three pilots. The first officer was being trained, and the captain was supervising the first officer. Another first officer was seated in the jump seat and was acting as the safety officer. By 9.53 a.m., the plane was over Germany at 36,000 feet. The pilots conducted their approach briefing. The first officer listened to the ATIS, or the Automatic Terminal Information Service, a broadcast from the airport that beams out information like weather and runway in use. On that day, they'd be landing on runway 18 right. They'd be performing an ILS CAT-1 approach. The runway was equipped with the much more precise CAT-3 system, but the pilots were not trained on the CAT-3 system. The 737 began its descent as it entered Dutch airspace. By 10.15 a.m., the plane was descending. They were descending down to 7,000 feet. The pilots and ATC were talking about the instrument approach when they got a configuration warning about the landing gear. That was weird. They were pretty high up. Landing gear configuration warnings usually happened at lower altitudes. As they flew, this happened quite a few times. The captain remarked, radio altimeter. His radio altimeter was malfunctioning. It showed an altitude of negative 8 feet. The radio altimeter, as the name implies, uses radio waves to measure the altitude of a plane. There are antennas at the bottom of the fuselage and they beam out radio waves. Those waves are reflected by the terrain back towards the airplane. That delay between the transmission and the reception is used to calculate the altitude of the airplane. But this failure didn't phase the pilots too much. They were asked to descend down to 2,000 feet, and the captain started to talk to the ground handling arm of Turkish Airlines about their arrival. Minutes later, the plane was at 2,000 feet, and the pilots slowed the plane down to 195 knots. They slowly started to bring the flaps out. Air traffic control vectored the plane to set it up for an approach onto runway 18 right. The autopilot on the right-hand side had been engaged for pretty much the entire flight, and for the landing, the crew wanted both autopilots online. But when they tried to engage the autopilot on the left-hand side, the left-hand autopilot failed to engage, and the right-hand autopilot disengaged. Something was off, so they decided to re-engage the right-hand autopilot, and they decided to use that autopilot for this landing. As the plane hit 160 knots, the landing gear was extended and flaps were set to 15. The plane was a few minutes from touchdown. It had lined up with the runway, but it was still a bit too high. The runway was 5.5 nautical miles away and they needed to lose some altitude. The pilots dialed in a descent rate of 1,400 feet per minute into the autopilot so that they could intercept the glide slope from above. Usually, you just fly below the glide slope, you intercept the glide slope, and then you follow it down all the way to the runway. Intercepting a glide slope from above was a bit more tricky and demanding. A few moments later, the plane was handed off to Skipol Tower. The first officer was the one flying the approach, and the safety pilot noted that the radio altimeter was still broken on the captain's side. As he did so, the plane intercepted the glide slope, and the autopilot began to follow the glide slope down. The plane was supposed to stay at 160 knots, but from the moment it intercepted the glide slope, its speed started to fall. 10.24 a.m., Flight 1951 got its clearance to land on runway 18 right. The captain acknowledged. This would be the last time ATC would hear from Flight 1951. The plane continued to slow down. The plane hit the required speed of 144 knots at an altitude of 800 feet above the ground, and they extended the flaps to 40. Moments from touchdown, the captain and the first officer went over some checklists. As they were about to check the last item off of the checklist, the captain called out 500 feet. 
In a cockpit, the non-flying pilot monitors the plane's altitude and makes callouts so that everyone knows where the plane is in relation to the ground. The last item on the checklist was to warn the cabin crew about the landing so that they could be seated. As the safety pilot finished doing that, the stick shakers activated. When the plane is dangerously close to a stall, the control columns vibrate. When this happened, pilots knew that they had to act immediately. The safety pilot drew the pilot's attention to their airspeed. Their speed was at 110 knots, when it should have been at 144 knots. The throttles were pushed forward in an attempt to avert the oncoming stall. The captain said, I have, indicating that he wanted to take over flying duties. But strangely, the throttles moved back to idle on their own. It was almost as if the plane had a mind of its own. The automation was disengaged as the pilot struggled to stave off the stall, which was a hard thing to do considering that they were only at 107 knots. The throttles were pushed to max power again as the plane warned them about their dangerously low altitude, but they never regained control of the plane. Flight 1951 crashed 1.5 kilometers short of runway 18 right. Unfortunately, nine people did not make it. For the investigators, the flight data recorder gave them their first clue. The pilots were aware of the faulty radio altimeter. In fact, this same flaw had popped up on a few flights before this one. The radio altimeter was faulty on the captain's side, and it was sending out incorrect data. The data from the radio altimeter can be of one of three types. The data can be normal, which meant that it was correct and usable. It can be in a state called non-computed data, where the data signal was too weak, but the system is fine. Or it can be unusable, which is what happens when there is a fault with the system. On the approach to runway 18 right, the radio altimeter showed an altitude of negative 8 feet. Now, that was an altitude that was impossible for the plane to attain. But this simple malfunction had far-reaching consequences for the airplane. This faulty data was sent to the autothrottle, a computer that controlled the throttles of the airplane. Now, the autothrottle thought that the plane was really low, even though it was thousands of feet in the air. When a plane comes into land, right before it lands, the pilots carry out what's known as a flare. In a flare, you pull back power and raise the nose of the plane in anticipation of the touchdown. This is done so that the plane gently touches down on the runway. But now, the autothrottle thinks that the plane is about to touch down, and so it cut power to the engines for the landing that it thought was inevitable. That's why the plane pulled the throttles to idle when the pilots asked for more power. This shouldn't have been a problem. The system should have disregarded the data but the data being sent to the autothrottle was characterized as normal. Had the system known that the data was unusable, it would have sampled data from the other radio altimeter, but that didn't happen. Here's where Flight 1951 got unlucky. The flare mode is programmed to activate only when some conditions are met, for example, like flap position, but unfortunately, all of those conditions were met. So when Flight 1951 was making its final approach, the autothrottle, thinking that the plane was just about to land, cut power to idle. This caused the plane to drop in height and speed. The autopilot was trying to maintain the glide slope to the runway because that's what it was programmed to do, and so it was pitching the plane up in an attempt to get the plane back on glide. So right now, one computer was pitching the plane up and another one was reducing power from the engines. They're doing diametrically opposite things. The autopilot is like, let's climb, and the autothrottle is like, nope, we're about to land, I'm reducing power. The thing is though, this was kind of a known problem. Other 737s had had this issue, and the accident airplane had 148 instances where the altimeter malfunctioned in just a span of 10 months. In other cases where this happened, the pilots just flew the plane in manually. This was such a problem that Boeing and Turkish Airways had started to install rubber gaskets around the antennas 
to keep moisture out of the antennas. This seemed to solve the problem a bit as the number of reported incidents went down slightly. So why did the altimeter fail in the first place? The manufacturer of the altimeter thought that it was due to a phenomenon known as direct coupling. Usually a signal is beamed out, it's reflected by the terrain, and it is sensed by the receiving antenna. In a direct coupling, the signal just travels from the transmitting antenna to the receiving antenna because they're damaged by corrosion, snow, or ice. Something that could have saved the pilots was a bit of software known as a comparator. A comparator would compare the output of both radio altimeters and it would check to see if they both matched up. This feature was included on newer versions of the plane, but that newer code was not compatible with the accident airplane. Okay, so the automation really messed up on this flight. The two computers were basically trying to get the plane to do opposite things. But at any point during the approach, the pilots could have just pushed the throttles forward and held them there, or they could have hit the toga buttons, or just gone around. Why didn't they realize that they were getting into a dangerous situation? On this approach, they were intercepting the glide slope from above. This increased the workload in the cockpit. This also pushed back the landing checklist. So as the plane was just about to land, they were still busy with the checklist. In addition to that, Turkish Airlines says that if your plane is unstabilized at 1,000 feet, you should go around. This meant that when the plane hits 1,000 feet in altitude, it must be on the correct glide slope, configured for landing, at the correct speed, etc. This approach was not stabilized. When the plane was at 1,000 feet, the flaps were not at 40. It was too fast. The list just goes on. The pilots should have gone around, but they didn't. Why? Past research suggests that despite the set guidelines, pilots go ahead with the approach if they feel like they can make continuous assessments about the state of the airplane. For example, a pilot might go, oh, we're only 200 feet below the glide slope. I'll just make up for that as the plane flies along. Even though that is discouraged, the tendency to do that is strong. Another thing that prevented them from going around was what happened inside the cockpit. At the first sign of trouble, that is the stick shaker activation, the first officer brought the nose down and added power, but the captain said, I have, indicating that he wanted control. So the first officer most likely took his hands off the throttle. No one was holding the throttles in place. This is when the auto throttle pulled the throttles back to idle. It took them too long to push the engines back up to max power. Had they prevented the auto throttle from pulling the throttles back, the stall could have been averted. But by the time they commanded full power, the plane was too low and they had no chance of recovering from the stall. All of this, everything that I just said, was from the report. But with the benefit of hindsight, we now know that we did not learn from our mistakes. The crash of Turkish Airlines Flight 1951 underscored the importance of using data from multiple sensors, adding redundancy to the system. In the case of Flight 1951, Boeing had already rolled out software changes to newer versions of the 737, where the computer would use data from both sensors. But for some reason, they did not use that dual sensor philosophy on another jet that they developed, the 737 MAX. In the 737 MAX crisis, a faulty AOA sensor sent corrupted data to the computer and that caused two accidents. Had they written the 737 software to use data from both AOA sensors, they could have avoided the whole 737 MAX debacle. I genuinely want to know if there's a technical reason as to why they can't use the data from both sensors at once. They were able to do it with the radio altimeter, so why not the AOA sensors? Is it a bandwidth problem? Adding more redundancy saves lives, and aviation is only as safe as it is today because we learn from our mistakes. Do you think that we've learned from our mistakes? Or do you think that another Turkish Airlines Flight 1951 is bound to happen again? Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I'll catch you guys next time. Stay safe.